commissioning this report from the uh, Productivity Commission, the Federal Government gave us two key tasks to look at. Firstly, to assess regulatory and policy barriers, and I stress that this inquiry is actually about barriers, not coming up with a framework for adaptation. And secondly, to identify high priority reforms to address those barriers. Um, it's important to note that the terms of reference came from COAG, so we were invited to look at all levels of government when we were, when we were uh, dealing with this issue. The process so far, well, we got terms of reference in September last year. An issues paper we released in uh, at the end of October last year. We had lots of meetings with government, with businesses, with other organisations uh, and research organisations. We received 79 submissions before the draft. We held a number of roundtables on insurance, on infrastructure and local government. We put a draft report out in April, we, which had uh, 13 draft recommendations and six information requests. Since then, we've had 63 submissions and, most, and they're still coming in. Um, so it's actually been, uh, been uh, quite, a, quite an interactive process. One of the other things that we did during the course of the inquiry before the draft was actually to go to New Zealand to talk to the uh, earthquake people in New Zealand, see if there are any lessons that we could learn from uh, what happened in Christchurch. I think it's important that we uh, look at the relationship between adaptation and, uh, and mitigation. Um, the need to adapt to climate change, the adaptation task, will depend on the extent of uh, climate change. And that the size of that task will depend on the level of emissions, it will depend on the effectiveness of mitigation actions, uh, and that will determine the future climate, and that future climate will determine the impacts uh, that occur as a result. And of course those impacts will be different in different areas, very localised. It's also important to, mean, to remember that uh, while mitigation action, the impact of mitigation uh, is a global issue, um, adaptation is very much a local issue. I think one of the other things that characterises uh, this uh, issue of adaptation is the issue of uncertainty. As I mentioned, it all depends on the level of emissions, the uh, degree, the effectiveness of mitigation, and there, there are uncertainties in relation to those two things. There are uncertainties in relation to how that's going to play out in the climate and in terms of their uh, localised impacts. And I guess the greatest uncertainty is in relation to the location, timing and severity of extreme weather events. One of the other factors here is that there are long time frames involved um, and any uh, decisions made now that might incur costs now might not have benefits that occur until many years on. And those sorts of decisions are particularly difficult to take. To take. The other issue, one of the other issues about long time frame is that, um, that uh, it's very difficult to make a decision now that's going to have an impact in years to come. And so when do you actually make, when do you decide to make that decision? How do you decide what's the best time to make that decision? So these all add to the complexities of dealing with adaptation. I think the other point that I've alluded to is the fact that climate change and adaptation, the adaptation issue really refers to, I guess, there's several dimensions. One is that there's gradual change in the climate, and the other one is the issue of extreme events. And those two can be uh, regarded quite differently. The first task that we were given was to assess the barriers to effective adaptation. Now, it's our view that most adaptation will occur autonomously, uh, without government intervention, as people manage their lives, they take climate change into account, or changing in the climate into account, and they manage their risks accordingly. The terms of reference refer to, refer to dealing with effective adaptation and barriers to effective adaptation, but effective wasn't actually defined in the, in the terms of reference for us. And it's our view that the objective of adaptation uh, to climate change should be to increase community wellbeing. And so we defined effective adaptation as adaptation that enhances the well-being of the community and, and Blair talked quite extensively about well-being. But if there are barriers to that effective adaptation, they could uh, restrict the ability of people to identify, or organisations to identify, evaluate or manage any risks uh, in a way that maximises community well-being. And the sorts of barriers we might be talking about, for instance, are in emergency management and these were identified, some of these were identified in the reviews of the uh, Victorian bushfires, the Queensland floods, issues like the coordination between uh, different emergency management authorities. We've uh, looked at potential barriers and we've classified them into four groups. Uh, market failures, public goods, uh, market failures, sorry, regulatory barriers, governance and institutional barriers and behavioural barriers. 
And in terms of market failures, the sorts of things we're talking about might be imperfect information. So, for instance, in relation to uh, people understanding climate change, in relation to insurance, regulatory barriers, things like barriers to free water trade in the Murray-Darling Basin. Governance and institutional barriers might be things like uh, uh, challenges for local government, uh, like capacity, like uh, institutional arrangements, uh, understanding what they're responsible for, roles and responsibilities. And behavioural barriers, which I guess is something that, uh, that uh, Blair really addressed in his talk, um, how we process information and make decisions, and really uh, decisions about climate change. So if you don't believe in climate change, are you actually going to uh, do anything about uh, adaptation? The role for government. Um, we're asked to look at the role for government. Now, as I su suggested, it's our view that uh, most adaptation will occur without government intervention. But it's true uh, that uh, governments uh, do have a role and could have a role. I mean, firstly, they're responsible for managing risks in their own areas and to their own activities. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these things all need to be coordinated at a national level. The second thing governments certainly have a role in is ensuring that their regulation doesn't impede adaptation. Uh, the third thing is addressing barriers, um, although it's important to, to note that even if you do it, find a barrier, it doesn't mean that government intervention uh, is going to make it better. Um, and the fourth thing is managing distributional impacts, uh, which clearly is an important role for government. One of the challenges, of course, is, uh, is it appropriate for the government to intervene or not? Um, there may be benefits in the government intervening where the benefits to the community, the net benefits to the community, um, make it worth it. But in other, case, in other cases, government intervention might impose more costs than the barrier itself. So, for instance, uh, if governments uh, subsidise premiums for household or property insurance, uh, whether directly or underwriting risks, it may be that the costs of doing that actually exceed the benefits to the community. One of the other points to remember is that structural change uh, in the community and in the economy can occur without the government, without government intervention. So, for example, things like information communication technology um, has, has occurred pretty well without a lot of government intervention. And the key to uh, successful structural change in the economy, and this is, is certainly uh, broadly noted, is having a flexible, uh, responsive uh, economy. The second task that we were given was to identify uh, what reforms, um, uh, identify the reforms that would uh, enhance uh, effective adaptation. In, a, in, in our terms, where the benefits would exceed the cost to the community as a whole. We have identified what we've described as high priority and lower priority reforms, and clearly um, the way we ex we've explained this, um, uh, um, Perhaps we haven't explained it as well as, as, well as we meant, so we're, we're taking on board the extensive commentary we've had on this. But what we described as high priority reforms were reforms that would help people better manage the risks they face in responding to the current climate and the current climate variability. Because you, it's relatively certain what the current climate variability is like, it's easier to identify and to quantify the costs and benefits of any reforms to help better manage that, to help people better manage that. And if the costs are likely to be less than the benefits, then the reforms actually should proceed. In other words, there's a much higher degree of, a higher degree of certainty. Not only does it improve your adaptability of the climate today, but also improves adaptive capacity for the future. However, if you're looking into the future, uh, where some of the uh, changes and the impacts of the climate are not, not as certain as they are today, uh, and, and there is going to be considerable uncertainty, um, then it's harder to quantify the benefits and the costs and identify the benefits and the costs. So what we say is that uh, while it's important that you might take low cost preparatory actions to deal with the future climate, taking high cost expensive options um, uh, is, where, where the costs do exceed the benefits as far as you can tell is, is not a desirable thing to do. In other words, you should delay costly action until more information is available which of course is the, the approach, the real options we're talking about. Now, what we've suggested in terms of high priority reforms, we've uh, identified a few areas where we believe that uh, high priority reforms uh, do in fact exist. And the first one is economic reform to build adaptive capacity. As I've mentioned, um, history suggests that a flexible economy means that, that the country can adapt to um, structural change and take on board structural change uh, most effectively.
So it's our view that uh, governments should aim to flex increase flexibility and growth in the economy. And there are three areas that we've identified as examples here. One is that governments should phase out inefficient state and territory taxes like stamp duties on property and insurance taxes and levies, and uh, they should be phased out and replaced with more um, efficient taxes. Secondly, government transfers, for instance, assistance uh, in, in drought relief um, should be um, phased out because it, it stops people uh, adapting to, uh, to changes in the climate. Now we're pleased to see that governments have made a decision to do that, um, which they made just as we put our report out. And the third area where governments can certainly improve the flexibility of the economy is, is looking at regulations which, impose, which restrict competition or impose unnecessary costs. And an example here is the one I've mentioned about restrictions on water trading in the Murray-Darling Basin. Another area where governments can, uh, can step in uh, and, and improve the um, flexibility and adaptability of the economy uh, is in terms of hazard mapping. Um, recently, the Australian government accepted a recommendation of the uh, Natural Disaster Insurance Review to establish a flood, flood risk information portal to coordinate flood maps and develop guidelines for flood mapping uh, in the future and flood risk information. Now, it's our view that this initiative ought to be expanded over time to cover other hazards um, and that it ought to be uh, take into account climate change where feasible and be regularly updated. We see the provision of that hazard information to the community as a really important way of helping the community manage their own risks in their own situation if they're aware of the risk of particular hazards to their uh, particular property. We see that as an important one. The other, whoops, the other area that we think, uh, another area that we think uh, action should be taken is in terms of local government. Local government is, is one of the big areas where the rubber hits the road in this issue of uh, adaptation. And, a lot of the, or some of the barriers that we've identified really do uh, provide impediments to effective service delivery by local government. And the issues that seem to, that were raised to us by local government and by others are firstly the clarity of role and responsibilities of local government compared, say, with the state and sometimes federal government, particularly in the areas of land use planning and, and, uh, and protection and building areas, uh, also emergency management. Another area that local government has challenges in, and this doesn't only relate to, uh, to adaptation, is of course constraints uh, on their ability to respond to these things. Issues like skills shortages, financial constraints, access to information and guidance to inform decisions. A lot of uh, council said to us, there's lots of information out there, but how do we actually use it? What do we do with it? And, and how do we actually respond? How do we put a, plan, a useful plan in place? The third issue that came up loud and clear in terms of the discussions we had was one of legal liability. Uh, council's concern about if they make a decision, does it make them liable for that decision? If they don't make a decision, does it make them liable for, for not making a decision? And we've seen a few examples of that in some court cases uh, around the country. So the issue of clarifying their legal liability seemed uh, an important one to us. Emergency management, um, which is where extreme events, uh, you know, play out and the response to extreme events plays out in this country. We've seen a fair bit of it recently. There's a lot of work going on uh, in that area, particularly as a result of, um, of uh, recent emergencies like floods and bushfires. Um, but some of those recent reviews have shown that uh, following natural disasters, the roles and responsibilities of the various players in responding to these events isn't always clear, or there are gaps in that coverage. And further, the natural disaster response and re recovery uh, arrangements, we believe, may give rise to uh, barriers to effective adaptation by the way uh, funding uh, for recovery uh, is, is handled and the arrangements of that funding, the, the, the guidelines for that funding, and it might distort incentives for states and local government. So we believe that it's necessary or it's desirable that there's a uh, public independent review of those arrangements um, to try to resolve some of those issues. The fourth issue that we wanted to draw to people's attention as a high priority reform was uh, uh, land use planning and building. That they're perhaps not as well integrated as they might be, um, but that'll require coordination by the Commonwealth, by the, state, the states and territory governments, and the importance of uh, the National Construction Code and associated standards taking climate change into account. Um, the uh, building Australian Building Codes Board has, of course, responded uh, to our draft report uh, indicating that they do take it into account. Um, so we're going to need to clarify some of our language in the report. 
Moving on to what we described as lower priority for reforms, and really this is the case where there is greater uncertainty in the future, where it's harder to identify specific um, impacts, harder to identify costs and benefits of particular reforms. Um, and it's our view that while lower, lower cost, um, perhaps reversible, but prepar preparatory reforms uh, could be put in place, some of the expensive high cost ones uh, ought to be uh, deferred until there is uh, information that suggests that uh, these will yield ben net benefits to the community. And we identified in this area, we identified three uh, lower priority reforms. The first one was um, downscaled climate change projections. In other words, doing the research and modelling to provide uh, information uh, at a very localised level on what, what's likely to happen with climate change so that people a very high resolution so that people are actually and local governments are able to look at their specific area in particular and the impacts that are likely to occur. The second one was uh, how, how to deal, and this was the, I guess, the issue that, uh, that, that Blair raised too, that we raised in our report, this issue of land use planning. If people uh, are going to start to move into an area um, which might be subject to uh, climate change impacts or currently live in an area that might be subject to climate change impacts, how do you deal with that in the future? It's our view that uh, in relation to this land use planning issue, either greenfield or existing sites, um, it's important that it be done in a risk management framework, that the community's level, acceptable level of risk uh, be assessed and that uh, clearly some kinds of cost-benefit analyses of these issues needs to be undertaken. And what it's our view that a number of, strate number of strategies have already been suggested for consideration, things like in greenfield sites, rolling easements, um, setbacks or time-limited developments, and uh, Blair did comment on those. It's our view that it's appropriate that there, there is a national conversation started about these things, about these issues, and what are the appropriate instruments to use, and how do you deal with these issues? What are the appropriate tools that should be put in place? And while we may not need to use these tools right now, we will very likely down the track need to, need to use those tools. So we really need to start having this discussion right now so that when the time comes, we're actually ready to, to take the action that both the, the community uh, finds acceptable and governments are, are prepared to accept. The other side of that is, of course, existing settlements, uh, how to deal with uh, existing settlements subject to climate change, and there have been a few issues recently in, in the press that have highlighted this issue. Um, strategies protect, accommodate and retreat. Again, how do you actually deal with these on the ground? What's the best way to deal with these? What's the, what's the individual's and the community's acceptable level of risk and what are they prepared to pay for? And again, we believe that in, in respect of that, there needs to be start having some kind of national discussion about these issues, uh, and some coordinated discussion so that people can air their views and come up with a, uh, an agreed way forward or agreed ways forward. There are some reform op options suggested that we uh, believe should not proceed. The first one is um, mandatory flood insurance with uh, opt-out provisions. Um, while mandatory flood insurance uh, for households and businesses might raise awareness of uh, flood risk for uh, individuals and for households, the cost of insurance is very likely, of that insurance is very, very likely to rise. And it's very likely that uh, some insurers would drop right out of the uh, household insurance market because they don't wish to provide flood insurance. Um, and that would uh, reduce the competition in the market. And it's obvious that this mandatory flood insurance uh, should not proceed unless a regulatory impact statement shows that the benefits do, in fact, exceed the costs. The second area that we believe should not proceed is subsidies for household insurance, uh, which has been proposed. Um, again, it's our view that it distorts uh, risk management uh, by households, um, and certainly uh, the challenge there uh, in other other countries has shown that uh, governments providing flood insurance uh, uh, generally leaves the agency of government in a very parlous financial state. The third area that was proposed is a systematic uh, national competition policy style review of um, legislation. Now while those sorts of, where you thoroughly review legislation, you assess it against a particular uh, principle um, and then uh, recommend uh, modifications according to whether it meets that principle or not. Um, such a, a review um, can be very effective. NC National Competition Policy review of legislation was very effective. Um, one of the issues about it is that it is a very costly process to, to do properly. 
And it's our view that given that we haven't been able to identify very many barriers to adaptation, um, we don't believe that it's uh, worth pursuing. So um, we also had some requests for further information, which I won't go into, but really uh, it was really trying to get some clarification on some issues in which we were unable to get uh, detailed in preparing the draft report. I guess the one that I do want to mention is the uh, possibility of using property titles, uh, residential contracts and other documents that relate to um, landholders' you know, uh, ownership or, or tenancy of land which communicate those natural hazard risks. So having as a standard provision on rates notices, for instance, on property titles, on rental contracts, so the people are actually aware of, of the risks in the place that they live. And we're really asking, is this a sensible way to go? Are there other ways to go? Are there issues we need to um, deal with about it? Um, so this gives you an indication of the issues we want more information of. I think one issue that we still haven't yet got much information on is uh, whether uh, any economic regulation of infrastructure is impeding investments in facilitating adaptation. Um, it would be interesting if, if, if there are any uh, individuals in this room which uh, have any information on that because that is one area that has come up as, a, as an issue that sometimes economic regulators may clamp down on the... On the um, on the um, revenue allowed to a, um, uh, an infrastructure provider or an infrastructure servicer, like for instance an electricity company, and not let them uh, spend money which they say is necessary for climate adaptation. Uh, that's a, the sort of example that's been raised with us, but we certainly haven't found any uh, in reality yet. The key messages of our report, uh, most adaptation will be done by households, businesses and communities without government intervention that there is a limited role for government, um, looking after their own backyard, providing information, uh, dealing with distribution issues, for example. We could not find, and there don't appear to be many barriers to effective adaptation, and it's our view that the priority ought to be to enable better risk management so people can manage uh, their lives better in the current climate that we live in, and that will uh, set them up better for the future and enable them to manage better today. And adaptation to uncertain future climate t trends is less of a priority, we believe, uh, than uh, responding to the current climate more effectively. Issues raised since the draft report. As I mentioned, we've had over 60 submissions um, and we've met, obviously, with a number of people and had a number of discussions uh, with individuals and organisations. Um, and, of course, this issue of lower priority, higher priority. Um, when we say lower priority, it doesn't mean it's unimportant. Um, really it means doing the lower cost things now and deferring the higher cost ones until you have uh, further information, better information, so you can quantify the costs and benefits better. Um, and we'll be taking these issues on board when we revise the report for the final report. The other issue that's been stated is that we overstate, suggested is that we overstate uncertainty uh, in the draft report. Uh, really, uh, I think we were trying to get the message across, which we clearly didn't do well, that issues of timing, location in particular, of um, extreme events is, is really where a lot of the uncertainty lies. But clearly we will uh, clarify those issues in the final report. It's been suggested we had too much reference to gradual climate change instead of extreme events in the report and tipping points and things. Um, our use of the phase current, current climate, uh, suggesting, uh, implying to people that we uh, believe that the current climate is static uh, whereas, in fact, it's not. It's changing. It's variable and changing over time. Um, our treatment of cognitive barriers, um, people suggested that uh, we thought it was... The impression we gave that was that we thought it was too hard, um, so, you know, it's too hard to do anything about, so uh, we won't, won't uh, treat it very um, thoroughly. Um, so, again, we're going to have a, have a look at that, at that particular issue uh, more closely. And I guess that really relates a lot to the issue that, uh, that Blair raised about do people believe in climate change, so therefore will they, will they respond? Uh, the Commission's use of real options, our treatment of real options, um, and again, I think that was interpreted sometimes as we're recommending deferring all adaptation actions. Um, that's not, in fact, the case. Uh, national coordination, there were many that suggested that we should recommend national coordination and a role for the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Again, we'll look at that and health and climate change adaptation uh, was suggested that we hadn't given enough treatment to that. So our next steps, uh, further submissions, they're still welcome till we finish the final report, although the later they come, the less thoroughly they'll be read. Um, we'll undertake some more uh, consultation um, before we finalise the draft report. We're doing public hearings early next month, 
in at least four locations, and we'll get a final report to the federal government in September this year. Thank you.